So we've got uh, we've got Amir, CJ, Hans, and Mike, and they are going to hack 45 or 20 devices in 45 minutes. Let's give them a big party track welcome. Charge! All right, good stuff. Uh, hello, everyone. I wanted to welcome you to GTV Hacker Presents Hack All the Things 20 Devices in 45 Minutes, a GTV Hacker production. So, who are we? We're GTV Hacker. We formed uh, to root the original Google TV in 2010. We've released exploits for every Google TV device since then, plus some others, including the Chromecast Roku and many more to come today. Y you guys will really enjoy this presentation. So, who are we? Um, the speaking members today that you're going to get to hear from are myself. I work at Acuvant as a research scientist and I founded the GTV Hacker Group. There's CJ here. Uh, he's a security researcher, group head at uh, a nonprofit. Um, we have Hans Nielsen. He's security, uh, senior security consultant at Metasano. And we have Mike Baker, MBM, firmware developer and open co or OpenWRT co-founder. So who are the other members? There's only able to be four of us on stage to present and we have you know, roughly eight members. Um, we have Gynophage. He's actually running the CTF right now. Um, he's part of LegitBS. We have Sarik who was the creator of Cydia. We have Kua Huang who is a student and uh, has a troubled past apparently. Um, <laughs> and we have Tom Dwanger who goes by TD Wang and he's our APK reverser and really just handles anything Java. Um, so why do we hack all the things? Well, we own the hardware, why not the software? We also really don't like devices to end up in landfills. When a device hits its end of life, you know, it, it's, it can be not really useful anymore. It, it could just essentially kill a device like in the case of the Logitech review if any of y'all are familiar with it. Um, we also always aim to make the product better. If we can do anything we can to make the product better, you know, give it more functionality, whatever it is, you know, we do it. And last but not least, we really enjoy the challenge. Um, you know, it's, it's like solving a puzzle. You really just, you love it when you win. Um, so what takeaways are you going to get today? Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> You've got to do so, <laughs> Come on. You get a root. You get a root. Um, no, so. <laughs> What takeaways? So essentially 20, 20 devices in 45 minutes doesn't leave us a whole lot of time to spend on each device. What we're doing is consider this a showcase of things that will be added to our wiki right after the con uh, our presentation. We're going to give technical details, um, hardware diagrams, everything we can because it's going to be pretty hard to read and we're not going to give everything a whole lot of time. Um, so you know you see the, the link at the bottom of uh, our slide deck dc22.gtvhacker.com visit that right after uh, the presentation. When we get back to our hotel, we'll kill the basic auth on it. Um, and you know, you will get access to all the stuff you saw at the presentation. Um, so let me introduce Hans. Thank you, Amir. So there are a limitless number of ways to attack these kind of devices. It does everything. Uh, today, these 20 devices, we have three main methods that we're going to look at. Uh, we can use UARTs, serial ports, to talk to debug ports, get into devices where we shouldn't be able to. We can use EMMC. It's SD card-like and we can just connect to that, use that to modify storage directly to let us access uh, device operating systems. And also just a whole bunch of command injection related bugs. Uh, they are very, very popular in consumer electronics devices. So. Without further ado, let's, let's talk about a whole bunch of UART based hacks. So what, what is a UART? Uh, usually they're used to interact with debug ports on a board. Um, in consumer electronics, they're generally not used for any actual functionality. They're just used for the manufacturer to connect to it, do debug stuff, that kind of thing. Uh, it's a very, very simple interface. There's one wire for transmit, one wire for receive, and then one wire for a ground reference so that everything works. Uh, protocol simple, it's been around forever. It's way older than I am. Uh, How old are you? I am 27, thank you for asking. Uh, 
So yeah, it's, it's, it's this great simple protocol that shows up in all kinds of places because it's really convenient to use on these devices. Um, uses all kinds of different voltage levels. There's the serial port you're familiar with on your computer. Hmm? The, uh, So we have a few free UART adapters to give out at the end, for you to go play with your own devices with. I hope you get as much use out of them as we do. So what do we look for when we're trying to find a UART? Uh, usually they're pretty f easy to spot on boards. It consists of, you know, three or four pins, usually in like a line or a little square. Um, you can get a s oscilloscope, poke around the board, try and find things that look like they're spitting out data. You can see the waveform. Uh, so without further ado, let's, let's get started looking at the actual devices. So the first guy here is, it's a printer. Okay. So we have this networked all-in-one photo scanner printer, whatever thing. Um, it's running Linux. Everything runs Linux. So what can we do with this guy here? So if we take a look, there's, here's a board shot. So throughout the presentation we're going to be showing you board shots along with the place on the board where you can see the ports accessible. So if you look off to the left here, you can see where we've soldered on these four wires to a UART port. And you can see it's got that classic, you know, four pins in a row arrangement. So right there, there's our UART. Okay, awesome. So what can we do with that? Well, when we turn the printer on and we have that UART connected, the printer gives us this cool console menu. Okay. You know, it's got useful things like reboot the printer, reset the settings, or run arbitrary shell command. <laughs> so there we go. We didn't have to do anything. We got the shell there. With that sh run shell command, we can run whatever command we want, and then we can go have fun playing with our printer. The Belkin Wemo is internet connected wall plug. Basically, you can use your phone to turn things, a light, your coffee maker, on and off. Uh, it's, it's been widely exploited by various people. And yeah, it's a tiny, fun little device. So, pulling this open, you know, a little hard to read there, but off, in the, off the left of center, you can see the transmit and receive pins there. And once we hook up a UART to that, what do we get? Well, the internet tells us that, you know, oh, the UART's patched. They, they fixed that. Uh, it turns out that no, they, they didn't quite get that. So during recovery, you actually have two seconds to insert a command. Okay, so what do we do about that? We can just run the sing single command down here at the bottom. It kills the script that reboots it. And then there you go. We're running as root in recovery. We can do what we want. Cool. So this is a fun little embedded device. It is just a gateway kind of thing that controls smart light bulbs. Um, kind, of, kind of like the Philips Hue if you've seen that. Uh, uses Zigbee. Zigbee is a pretty popular protocol that we've seen in these things. Um, I know there's, there's been lots of great talks about Zigbee here already. Um, so yeah, this thing is kind of fun because it's got a power PC. You know, who uses power PC these days? You know, Apple hasn't done that for who knows how long. Um, it provides an SSH server when you run this thing, but we don't have credentials for that. Okay, too bad. What else can we do? You are. So look at the board. You can see those cool little test points down there at the bottom, the uh, red arrows. There's the transmit, there's the receive. The, uh, it, it's really fun just trying to find these things because they always just kind of stand out and you're saying, okay, what is this? And plug, in, plug in your multimeter, plug in your scope connect to it and see, is there stuff coming out of here? Can I do anything with this? So cool. We have the UART here. And it has U-Boot on it. It has U-Boot without any settings changed on it. It's just U-Boot. What is U-Boot? U-Boot is the bootloader that lets us load and run Linux. So we can talk to the bootloader. Now we can do anything. We can reflash the device. We can change the kernel command line. What does changing the kernel command line let us do? When booting Linux, you can provide it with a bunch of options. Uh, you know, how much memory does this device have? 
What port do I want my serial console on? What is the first program I want you to run once you've loaded that file system? So the init argument, you can pass bin sh to that. What does that do? It spawns the shell as root. Cool. Really easy way to get past all of the various other initialization scripts that might lock settings down or not provide consoles. Skips all that, goes right into a root shell, and then we can do what it, whatever it is we want. It turns out that the thing that we wanted to do was crack the root password. So we grab that, password is think green. It's good stuff. The file transporter, another device that came out recently, it's kind of neat. It's basically a cloud NAS, sort of. You have this device, it's got a big old hard drive in it, leave it on your home network, and then through their service, you can connect back to your home device and then access your files. Great. So, you know, pretty, pretty standard kind of device. It's running Linux, running ARM, build root based user land, which is a fun thing that we haven't seen as much of these days, but build root's awesome for those of you who have played with the WRT54G back in the day. Lots of fun there. So, pull this thing open. Oh, hey, look at that. They even gave us a header. Uh, <laughs> often we find that there are headers in devices, but uh, they're not populated. In this case, it was populated. So, again, we have a U-boot shell available, which lets us change the kernel command line again, so we can get that root shell, and then we can do whatever it is we want to with this device, which is awesome. The CoStar LT, it is the successor to the Vizio CoStar, which was a Google TV. This is no longer a Google TV. It's funny, we don't even hack Google TVs anymore, even being, despite being named GTV hacker. Uh, so ignore the arrow. The arrow is not actually what you want to look at. You want to look at the little red and white text up to the top left. There you go, there's the classic, you know, four pins in a row layout. You can see the receive and transmit there. So this was, this, this was a fun one because when we first turned it on, you know, we saw three lines of output from the UR. It was basically U-boot saying, hello, okay, here's the kernel. That was it, nothing. Okay, that was weird. Uh, at some point we left the flash drive plugged in and it said, oh, I don't, I don't understand the file system on this flash device. Okay, what do we do now? Uh, try FAT32. So format is FAT32, plug it in, try it. What do we get? Hey, I can't find fs.sys. Okay, that's really suspicious. <laughs> so we did a little bit of research into this and it turns out that fs.sys is a uBoot script image file, which is a file that uBoot will just load and execute arbitrary commands from. Cool. So we can then use the same tricks we used with the previous uBoot hacks and modify that init argument to the kernel again and with that we can get root. Uh, along with fs.sys there's this safe kernel.image1. We can use this to actually just boot an entirely different kernel just from a USB flash drive that we plugged in. Awesome. The Staples Connect is just another small home automation hub. It's rebranded OEM hardware. You know, we, we see a lot of this kind of stuff. It's, you know, it's got Wi-Fi, it's got Zigbee, it's got a USB port for plugging in your hard drives, whatever. Um, what do we have here? Hey look, it's a header. Hey look, there are receive and transmit pins on it. Sweet. What does that get us? Well, it got us a restricted U-boot environment. So, what do we do here? Well, the obvious answer is if we short out pins 29 and 30 on the NAND chip to ground, while it's booting, the U-boot environment that gets read from the NAND gets corrupted. U-boot says, uh-oh, resets everything, and uh, there we go. We can actually just type commands into the U-boot console again. So after we reset all of the, the uh, various properties and arguments in U-boot so that it can boot, we can just use the standard old init trick, get root on there, and congratulations, we have now rooted this. Um, we also cracked the password for this one. 
Uh, this was not a very hard crossword, password to crack, but it is useful to know that. Uh, at this point, I would like to introduce CJ. All right, so I'm going to talk to you about EMMC Flash. As he pointed out, EMMC Flash is pretty, con it's pretty much an SD card on the chip. The thought was that you can take an SD card, put it on a chip, not have to worry about any extra magical bits. A normal NAND flash will have extra bits that handles error correction, error correcting code, out of bounds stuff. It's usually a pain for developers to deal with. So drop an EMMC flash on there, then you can go ahead and just use a normal file system, access it like an SD card. Linux supports it, everything just supports it, it's great. And hacking wise, usually you can get into it with free, with rather cheap EMMC readers, which we're giving a few away, totally free. We have, um, since EMMC is pretty much electrically compatible with SD cards, many EMMC readers and SD card readers can be used one another. And if you're looking for, figure out, you know, you have an EMMC flash, it's BGA, you need pins to find. So the thought is, how do I do that? The thought, you can first look by, for nearby resistors, that's usually a plus. Um, furthermore, you can talk about board design. Sometimes things will be labeled, you'll see resistor numbers, then you can figure out increments and whatnot. Also, the command lines and the clock lines tend to be on one side of the flash, while the data lines tend to be on the other. So based off how it's routed, you can usually tell somewhat with intuition. And if that doesn't work, hook up to a logic analyzer, a clock line looks very specific, data lines will send a boatload of data. So you can grab it that way. If that doesn't work, then you pull the chip and trace it, which is what we did with the Amazon Fire TV, which I'll show you in a moment. But that picture, although small, is a BGA flash pulled and wired up to an EMMC reader, which is actually an SD card reader, so we could get a dump of it. But speaking of the Fire TV, so as we know, this is our device number seven. It's a quad core 1.7 gigahertz Snapdragon. Um, runs Fire OS, which is just a modified, well, heavily modified Android. And we have pinouts. So EMMC pinout on the left. Uh, two boxes died to find this. My first box, I found the pinout. I couldn't get it to work. So got a second box, pulled the flash, realized, no, I was right, but somehow in the process killed the first one. So third time's the charm, got it, rooted it, it's fine, it's great. So the pinout's on the left, it's also on the wiki, dc22.gtvhacker.com. And on the right we have a UART pinout, not a whole lot of information comes out of there, mostly fast boot related stuff. So moving on with the EMMC, we have the Hisense Android TV. It's a Google TV, sort of, they rebranded it to kind of lose the stigma. Uses a slightly newer processor. Uh, last year at DEF CON we demonstrated how to bypass secure boot on last year's entire system on chip family. It was a nice little bug. Um, but moving on with this Hisense, which is a quad core CPU, uses Android 4.2.2. We bring up the EMMC again. So pinouts, we have pinouts, data zero for a data line, command, clock, ground, and power. That is all you need. Usually easy to solder to. The resistors are small, but you're not pulling a flash. So considerably easier. For the high sense Google TV, pretty much what you do, you mount the factory setting partition, which um, by the system is mounted with no parameters. So no, no SUID, no, no exec. You can pretty much dump whatever you want on there and run it as a normal user. So wire it up, mount, mount the factory setting partition which contains a bunch of DRM stuff. So they usually don't touch it, which is good for persistence. Give it a good old 4755C mod and you're good to execute through ADB and just elevate. You could also modify system, which pretty much holds the general OS for Android and then put on super SU or things that most people are familiar with. But I like a normal, you know, static SU binary. Moving forward, never say something has never been hacked. In 2011, the post office, because they are the experts at refrigerator security, put out an ad stating, stating that a refrigerator has never been hacked. I did not have the room or the pretty much reason to spend $3,000 on a refrigerator, so finally got to do the second best thing, buy parts for the refrigerator. Enter the LG Smart Fridge, runs Android 2.3, which is a bit old, but okay. Uh, it's the brains of the fridge. It controls ice, compressor, water, pretty much everything. Normal usage, you would use it to track groceries or say, you know, I drank this much water today. It has Wi-Fi, USB, and SD card. So the first thought, pull it open. Here's what it looks like inside, at least parts. Again, big pictures on the wiki. Um, UART, which we actually found second, boots to a root console, but that's no fun. So what we did instead, 
went through EMMC, you've got to go the hard way. So you go in EMMC and you pretty much mount system as with the Fire TV. Um, what we did instead was we pushed a normal Android launcher. So when the system boots up, you'll see it a little later. It will pop up and pretty much ask you, you know, what launcher do you want to start? And you just start a normal one and then you can then run your own apps with relative ease. And again, since the UART already booted to a root console, we ended up finding that our secure was zero, which pretty much meant that they didn't even try. <laughs> but now moving on past some of the hardware stuff into command injection. So, um, just a heads up, user input cannot be trusted. Do not use shell commands in your stick code. Again, never ever trust user input. Um, if you do, please at least escape your commands. This counts for system as well because you see manufacturers, they'll put in an ls and then pull a variable with percent %s into system and then say I pass into that variable a semicolon reboot semicolon. It will execute ls semicolon reboot semicolon. In Linux the semicolon pretty much tells it let's execute a new command. Many times that will happen as root and you can get in. So a perfect demo of that, a series of Vizio smart TVs. Uh, the Broadcom 97000 based Yahoo powered smart TV, which is a little old, but it's still widely available. And full array backlit, which I like versus the thin ones, you get better blacks. Um, the smartness could be better, it's again a little old. TV's nice and thick thanks to that full array backlight. So there is a command injection via the Wi Fi password. If you're setting up Wi Fi, you go to menu, you go to network, you select Wi Fi. If you type in these commands, which I'll explain in a moment, you can have root over UART. So pretty much what we do is we take USB UART adapters, which we have some to give away very soon, um, enter the first command which makes it a character, character node. That pretty much tells the kernel where to send the data we want to. Uh, temp GTP hacker, you have a major and a minor that again just routes the data properly. Enter that, give it a minute or two, it will error out. Then you enter the large bash command which pretty much says take all of the input coming across that character device, send it to the shell and any, anything coming from the shell, send it to the character device which is great. Then we have root over USB UART. So that was device 10. Moving on to device 11, the Sony BDP S5100 Blu-ray player. It's a Blu-ray player. as an MTK 8500 series chipset. It runs Linux, Wi-Fi, Netflix, Voodoo, smart apps, all of that fun stuff. Keep that in mind for a minute. Next up we have the LG BP530 Blu-ray player. It's again a Blu-ray player with the same chipset that runs Linux, Wi-Fi, Netflix, Voodoo. They're pretty similar and we found that there's actually a bug in these supplied packages from the chipset manufacturer that affects many players, possibly including many more than this. If you put an empty file named voodoo.txt on a FAT32 drive in a folder called Voodoo, and also create a folder, a uh, file called voodoo.sh in that same folder. Add these commands in, which pretty much overlays the password, so we, because we didn't want to crack it this time, um, just zeros it out, and a telnet command. You press voodoo with the drive in, you get a telnet shell on the LG player and the Sony player, and many other players with the same chipset, such as the next one, which is the Panasonic BDT 230. But, uh, that's easy. We found another one on this just because. So picture of the board, we have UART as previously explained, TX, RX ground. That was rather important for us in figuring out this bug because at times debugging output comes out across those pins that you wouldn't, know, excuse me, you wouldn't normally see but we're able to see it that way. There was, an L, there was a command injection in the network folder name. So typing in a command to start a telnet shell which we only noticed because of the UART, we are then able to inject commands and run them as root. So now I'm going to hand it off to MBM. Thanks CJ. So next up is the Motorola Razor. Now I'm not going to talk about Android, Android has been rooted. This is about the baseband. This is an isolated processor separate from Android. So the communication between Android and the baseband is done over a USB network connection. The baseband listens on the USB network port, uh, runs a diagnostic script 
and it runs that diagnostic script as root. Now, if you actually go and you look at the script, they're running a busy box command and piping the file name through awk. This means that using the file name, we can do an awk shell injection. So if we have a file name that uh, contains this x01 system, we can inject any command that we want and run it as root. So next up, we're going to talk about the Pogo Plug Mobile. This is a uh, cloud storage device, um, also a uh, NAS, so you can plug in a uh, USB drive. We've got a UART on it. This gives us access to the bootloader and the root shell, but we also have a command line injection using the web page. So if you go to the SQ Diag HP plug page and you add an action command, you can inject arbitrary commands. They all run as root. So if we move on to the Netgear push to TV, this is a set top box. We have the uh, UART pins. And through the UART, we can interrupt the bootloader. And through the bootloader, we can also control the Linux and run our own commands using the same init injection that was talked about earlier. Now, if you happen to miss the bootloader, you can also run commands using the root shell for a few seconds. And we also have command line injection via the web interface, you simply set the nickname of the box and that will be executed as root. So semicolon, whatever. <laughs> and you can make this persistent if you want. You can uh, mess around with the SPI. You can set the default U-boot environment variables and uh, set whatever you want to run a U-boot the next boot up. So moving on, we have the Omo Tello. This is a VoIP router. It's running OpenWRT. And we have a UART again. This is using uh, a console login, but we're talking about command injection. So they already have the SSH running, it's just firewalled by default. So what we need to do is to inject a command to change the firewall rules. And we do this using the web interface. We can uh, inject whatever command we want. And we're going to show you on the next slide the actual command, but we want to point out that the default root password is the exclamation mark omap123. We had a little bit of fun once we got in. We just dumped the password file and started a cracker. By default, the SSH is only available on the LAN, so there's no risk there. So this is the Omotello web interface. And if you look at the arrow there, we're pointing at the command. So if you type in the x.com, with the IP tables, you can adjust the IP tables rule. That gives you access to the SSH and you can use the password that I just gave. So next up we have the Netgear NAS. This is a media device. It's um, flash based, so everything's an SWF file. This is uh, a secure Broadcom SOC with encrypted updates. So everything on this box is signed so let's take a quick look at the UART. Again, this gives us uh, access to some things, but we're going to talk about the command line inje or the injection via the web interface. So when it downloads an update, the updates are downloaded over HTTP. This is a really bad idea. <laughs> so if I pull down one of the apps, pull it open, I can inject a malicious symlink and 
traverse the file system and dump files anywhere on the file system. So if I repack the app, put a man in the middle and feed it my version of the app using the update, I can drop a root shell. So moving on, we have the Asus Cube. We've already hacked this previously. We had an app available on the Play Store. Unfortunately, Google pulled it. They don't like these apps. So <laughs> let's talk about how to get back in. <laughs> if we mount an SMB share, we get the permissions of the SMB share. So all we need to do is set up an SMB share with the SU binary and we set the SUID bit. We can then ADB into the cube, run the SU binary and we get root. So now I'm going to hand off to Amir. Thank you Mike. Um, so let's, let's start having some more fun. Let's get some more interesting devices up. Um, I'm going to talk about the summer baby zoom Wi-Fi monitor. <laughs> so what this is, it's a Wi-Fi baby monitor. It has custom RF and it's uh, marketed as a secure baby monitor, baby monitoring device. So with our common pattern, first things first, we always look at UART. Here's the UART adapter uh, or the UART pinout. Um, it's a little hard to read again, dc222.gtvhacker.com for uh, the pinout soon after the uh, presentation. Um, but this actual bug, well the first bug, um, they, they have a hard coded username and password on the device that the binary uses to communicate with the web interface. Now, you know, this, this is a terrible practice. Um, from a security standpoint, you don't want to hard code credentials in every single device. Um, so if you can see below the credentials are leet speak, ms cat admin or c admin and authenticate is the password. Um, so let's get into the hard coded username and password. Um, if you call NVRAM show you can see that it lists three users, two of which have different credentials. Um, or actually different user rights um, and then you see the hard coded username and password actually also has admin as well as the snap admin which is the one that has the specific password that uh, it changes per device. Um, so let's get into some command execution on this device. Hard coded passwords are cool but uh, you know command injection, command execution, that's what we're always looking for. We want to run root commands. So systemgt.cgi is a binary that is accessible with admin credentials. It uses HTTP basic auth um, and the systemgt post var gets executed with system as root. Um, if you can see below we gave a little example of how you can uh, make a call to enable uh, a telnet server. Um, anytime you enable a telnet server with root, remember most cases it's probably not going to be password protected unless you're passing uh, like a dash l slash bin slash login which tells it that when someone connects to the device to run bin slash login, um, normally with some of these examples we do slash bin slash sh so when someone logs in it directly drops you to a root shell. Now anytime you do that again, don't leave that open. You don't want people connecting to your device. You know, let's be safe here. So 20 devices, you know, that's cool and all but this is DEF CON 22 and we want to take it one step further. So why not 22 devices? <laughs> so we, we figured and actually this was a, it was a lot of work to come up with 20 devices to hack and even more work to get 22 done uh, in the period of time before the conference. Uh, so let's, let's get into the next one. The next item on our list is the Samsung Smart Cam. What this is, it's very similar to the summer Wi-Fi Baby Zoom Pro um, but it's just a standalone camera. It doesn't have a handheld RF uh, monitor, it doesn't uh, pan and tilt. Uh, it's just a network camera with a speaker and a microphone. It has a web interface for local access and a mobile phone app for remote access. Um, and yeah, so let's get into the uh, UART adapter. 
Again, you can see a populated pin header with ground RX, TX, and VCC, and we note the uh, BOD settings and connection settings at the very bottom, as well as the fact that it only does console logging. So the pre-auth on this particular device is rather interesting. We found this guy um, after looking at how they process logins and how they handle creating the original administrator password. When you first set up the device, you're prompted to, to set up your own administrator password. The downside to this is that they don't actually check that the password is already set. So you can call this script to change the password on an administrator password that's already set up. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's uh, a nasty bug. So uh, the CGI script normally does the auth check, but not on the new user. Um, and this is only accessible over the LAN. Uh, so command injection on this particular thing. Now, they, you can set up a wireless, uh, your wireless settings for your wireless net network at home, um, and you can set up a WPA2, WPA, uh, WEP, or open network. Um, with the WEP key, it's actually put into a config file and then pulled out a little while later. Um, and when it's pulled out, it's stored into a, a command. And so you get command injection by inputting a, uh, a shell escaped command into the web key. Um, it, can, it can be exploited without, phys without physical access to the device because how, how it works is in order for the bug to get triggered, you set up your web key with you know, the malicious string and then to actually get it to do the connection, you have to unplug the network cable unless it's already connected over Wi-Fi. If it is connected over Wi-Fi and you change the web key, it could disconnect you and you could just lose access. Um, you know, it's, it's, it needs the physical access essentially to trigger. Um, the other thing is the web interface runs as root. Um, so you get root command injection by changing the Wi-Fi web key. In this screenshot, this particular screenshot, we show kind of the input field where the command injection occurs and we give an example of how to enable a root telnet shell. Um, I mentioned earlier passing slash L slash bin slash SH or dash L slash bin slash SH tells it to uh, pass new connections over to slash bin slash SH. So again, this is another one of those that you don't want to do and leave running on your camera unless you change, you add a new user and do slash bin slash login. Um, so that's the route on that device. That's our 21st. I'm really excited to tell you guys about the 22nd, mostly because I see so much potential in this device, mostly for us hackers. Um, this device is called the Wink Hub. I really like this device mostly because of all the peripherals that it has and uh, the fact that this particular device has a Bluetooth chipset, a Wi-Fi chipset, a Z-Wave chipset, and a Zigbee chipset. It also has a TI-CC1101 RF SDR and it, you know, with a little bit of dev work, it could be a really great RF toolkit for any of the RF hackers out there. Um, it has multiple peripherals. Essentially what this is, it's a home automation gateway that you, it interacts with already set up APIs um, and, you know, it has all the communication methods so that it can contact all your devices and they even have their own line of devices from a propane gauge to a device that does humidity, temperature, light and motion sensing. Um, it also has uh, smart locks. And so the thing about this device, uh, we'll, we'll actually get to the uh, information about the device here in a second. Uh, so this is the board. It's a really pretty board. Everything's compartmentalized. Uh, the debug headers are all broken out. I mean, it's, it's really nice. The other thing about this device is it's an under $50 device. They have deals where you, if you buy peripherals, you can even get the device free. So, you know, if, if you're interested in RF stuff and you're willing to put a little bit of dev work, this is a really, really cool board. You notice it has five antennae on it. Um, it gives you the ability to uh, pretty much communicate with every smart device you can think of um, as long as there's some API available and uh, Wink has chosen to support it. Uh, so the Wink Hub has a command injection bug. Uh, if you don't read PHP, if you don't know PHP, you can see that there's a pseudo command that takes in a node ID and an attribute ID value that's passed in from the post variables. So this goes to a pass through command and then the return code is, is pushed back as well as uh, the, uh, 
the output of the command. So uh, really cool, take it home or go buy one, you can root it, have lots of fun. Um, and now probably what you guys have been waiting for, let's see if we can get dual core up here for uh, a, little, a little fun. I got it. Is it on the screen? Upper right. Upper right. Upper right. Right. Okay. Dual core. Got it. Uh, N80, anyone? <laughs> I could wrap all, hack all the things, but it's not going to turn out well, I promise you. <laughs> okay, sweet. Uh, in 80, come on, buddy. Okay. Good times. Just, yeah. just play. Like, uh, I, no music. It doesn't seem like fun. We got like a light show and stuff. In 80. Oh, I see him. Yeah. Yes. Let's welcome In 80 to the stage. Come on, guys. Look at him run for you. That's uh, that's a dedicated rapper right there. Thank you, buddy. You saved me. <laughs> okay. So rap music and rap music accessories. <laughs> uh, so while while he's rapping, we're gonna walk around. We're gonna hand out some of these UART adapters. We got some dual core CDs. We got a Chromecast. We're gonna hand out. We got EMMC adapters. We got roughly a hundred UART adapters. It's gonna be lots of fun. Got some cool lights. Let's have a good time, guys. This is the party track. Let's make it rain. Please make some noise for the GTV hackers hacking all the things. Now to be honest, that was a cheap ploy for me to try to catch my breath from running over here from the vendor area. <laughs> My name is Int80. I'm the rapper in Dual Core. You might have heard us from songs such as Drink All the Booze, Hack All the Things, which is what we intend to do here. But I want to give a shout out real quick. Anybody here hack cars? Cool. So a friend of mine published the Car Hacker's Handbook. It's licensed under Creative Commons. So you can download it for free online. You can also buy it on Amazon. I have a couple copies with me at my booth in the vendor area. If you hack cars, come talk to me about some cool car hacking shit. Maybe I can hook you up with a copy. Anyways, I'm going to do some rap music, probably run out of breath, maybe die. Uh, can, I, can I get you guys to like officially DJ like my DJ does and hit the space bar to start the song? Wiki, wiki. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you ready for this? You tell me when. All right, we'll count it down. One, two, wait, what comes after two? Not every geek with a Commodore 64 can hack into NASA. So I'm gonna say, drink all the booze. You guys yell, hack all the things. Yo, even up, settle scores quick. Our disaster recovery requires even more of this. Put your bites up, prove it or you fall. Think I my C64 and we blew it into orbit. And bison with eight straight perfects. Overvolt emotions make hate break circuits. In case you heard, it's a name fake service. Optimize a runtime to escape verdicts. Got an energy scope flow that they can't sign. Passing code, then sanitize command line, land mine. So before they'll see me after I'm advice dog, courage will plus velociraptor. Don't prove we're human unless we really have to. My team built schemes and destroyed recapture. Hate what they see. Finish this chapter. By the way, we're not any geeks. We hack into NASA. We drink all the booze. Drink all the booze. Drink all the booze. Got this five kid this red bull. They still give me wings. So we drink all the booze. Drink all the booze. Drink all the booze. Zero through three, we're in every single ring. Yo, I'm just waiting till my Blackberry dies. 
Cause I'll replace it with the Raspberry Pi Don't compare it to this track It makes everything they said dull Neutralize any threat To Red Skull to Dev Null They killed Virus Red as we mentioned But instead they ascended to the VX heavens And reincarnated as live wires Still inside we hide ciphers and sign device drivers Which school will we hit next? They didn't learn the format So we've got a print F Next step is a chin check Freestyles that I spit best They didn't decrypt I crush internet MCs and rhyme battles Get your Wi-Fi tackled, hacked by pineapple I don't think you'll like my Snapple Cause I popped it with vodka and a cyanide capsule You guys ready to hack all the things? Here we go We drink all the booze Drink all the booze Drink all the booze Got this my chemist red bull, they still give me wings, so we drink all the booze. Drink all the booze. Drink all the booze. You know there's gonna be security, right? First we drink all the booze, then hack all the things, the backdoor, the firmware on anything you bring. Regardless of the hardware, service or encoding, connected to the internet, someone's gonna own it. This is for the pirates, and clapping off the sound, attacking from the cloud, then we're back in underground. There's no mask and us now, we pop torn nodes around the globe, track and hunt you down. Hacked on schedule, added to your calendar, devices online. Here comes another challenge, a state infiltrated, so undercover. This is for my comrades who stare into debuggers and trace every buffer. Examining the code flow, haven't been to sleep, better pop another no goes. I think I'll need a planet sized urn, cause some men just wanna watch the world burn. Your turn. We still in jail. Drink all the booze. Drink all the booze. Drink all the booze. Got this five canvas red bull, they still give me wings, so we drink all the booze. Drink all the booze. Drink all the booze. Zero through three, we're in every single ring. I mean, these servers have more firewalls than the devil's measurement. Hack all the things. Yes! Make some noise for the GTV hackers, guys! I can't believe we had dual core out here. That's amazing, guys. Give a round of hand for this guy. He's... He did it without notice. He did it without pay. Just a great guy. So, real quick. Let's go to the slides again. What are we at? Okay, yeah, we gotta get out of here soon. Woo! Okay, so, so we're gonna have questions in the Q&A at the Chill Out Lounge. We wanna give a big thank you to, woo! Okay. You want me to read? No, I got it, <laughs> got it. All right. So we're gonna give a big shout out to DEF CON, we give a shout out to Dual Core, DD, GD, TT, FF, Radix, Minga, OXO, String, Cody Walker, Ian, Whitfield, uh, dc22.gtvhacker.com. We'll have our slides after we get back to our hotel room where we can uh, push the switch. And uh, wiki is gtvhacker.com, forums forum.gtvhacker.com, blog.gtvhacker.com for our blog. Woo! And uh, I gotta exercise more. <laughs> uh, freenode.net, channel GTV Hacker. Follow us on Twitter at GTV Hacker. We don't bite. We love hearing from the community. Thank you, everyone, for having us out. We love you guys. Thank you again. Thank you all.